those early meetings that I wasn't at and didn't organize, but I think is really valuable to the community is having updates from partners who are in the room. And this year, because we have so many people who are, which is really exciting, and so many people who wanted to give updates, um, we had to sort of cut that number down. We have about 20 organizations who are going to give short updates on what they're up to, what they've been doing sort of restoration-wise in the past year, maybe what they have coming up. Um, these updates are five minutes or less as a reminder, and I will interrupt you to cut you off if you go over five minutes because we have so many to get through. Um, we're basically sticking to the order that I sent out before, but um, Ben at Red Start needs to hop off a little early, so I told him he could go first. So he's going to go first, and then we'll go into that order. Um, so Lauren will be next, and I'll be typing in the chat who's up next so that people can kind of keep track of who's going. Um, so Ben, if you are ready, go for it. Yeah, thank you very much, Allison. Good morning, everybody. It's wonderful to look through the list of attendees and to think about all the good work that's getting done. I work with Red Start, and uh, I, we know um, most of you folks already, but I'll just say a few brief things about us and then talk about some of the things we're doing that, that are related to riparian buffer work in particular. Um, we're based in Orange County. Um, we've been around for uh, about 30 years, um, and we started as a forestry business, but we've been increasingly interested in ecological restoration work and doing more of it um, and, and more of it each year. You could kind of think of us in, in three ways. Because we manage a lot of land that's in the current use program, we're sort of a proxy for a lot of landowners, and so we, we often know where projects can get done because we know those landowners and know what they're interested in and what their land could use in the way of restoration. We also do a lot of implementation work. Um, and in this case, that's, that's planting and, and doing herbaceous control around riparian plantings. In that work, we're, we're often um, collaborating and working either for forest landowners or, or farm landowners, working with nonprofit organizations as partners, watershed groups, uh, NRCDs, um, public agencies, and, and doing um, uh, projects kind of all over the state. Um, we, you could also kind of think of us as a partner. We, we often are able to connect projects. Um, we may know of someone that's interested in doing a particular project and, and another organization working with, we can kind of help to put pieces together. So we're, we're um, really excited about the amount of progress that's being made over the past few years. It just seems like a lot of momentum for this type of work, which is incredibly important. Um, now to talk just briefly about some of the things that we have going on. Um, we are, uh, we, we can, Often our, our landowner base um, of, of clients, current use clients in particular, but other folks as well is expanding and, and more into the Lake Champlain Basin all the time um, in the Lamoille and the Winooski. So we're, we're often talking to landowners about places where projects can get done. And then, and then we're continuing to do a lot of planting, um, as I mentioned before. We also do a lot of herbaceous control around plantings that, that we put in, um, but also plantings that others have put in. And some of that is um, using a variety of techniques. Sometimes we're using bark or wood chip mulch. Sometimes we're using stone mulch, which we'll talk about in a brief presentation tomorrow. Uh, sometimes we're using herbicide and sometimes we're doing um, weed whacking. So just a little bit of, a little bit of uh, variety there, depending on what best fits the situation and the priorities of the, of the landowner and of the partners and of the funders. Um, we've also been talking with a number of you about the lack of um, planting stock and looking for ways to contribute to solving that problem. We've been growing a little bit of small stock in, into larger stock over the last year or two and sort of experimenting with that. And we're, we're talking about um, collaborating with a number of you on on, the, on a small nursery of some kind. And uh, hopefully that will progress and we'll have more information as we, as we nail down exactly what we're going to be doing and, um, and, and when we're gonna be doing it. Um, it was fun to hear you, Allison, mentioned strategic woody additions. We're also doing a lot of strategic woody additions. I'm looking forward to the presentation that's gonna come on that a little bit later. So that's a, that's a brief update from, from Red Start. 
and um, and I'll I'll mute myself and hand it back over to you now, Allison. Perfect. Thanks so much, Ben. So uh, next up, we have Lauren Jenis with the Lake Champlain Basin Program. Hello, everyone. I think my screen share is working. Um, my name is Lauren Jeunesse, and I work for the Lake Champlain Basin Program. We are pleased to be the funder of a new Streamwise Award Program for the Lake Champlain Basin, which is an outreach initiative designed to inform and incentivize rural and urban riparian private landowners to plant and protect native vegetative buffers to promote stream health and resiliency using a consistent marketing message and brand. We are hosting a Streamwise Award Program introductory webinar this Friday, April 1st at 1 p.m. for practitioners who may be interested in utilizing Streamwise. And the webinar will also be recorded and posted um, on our new streamwisechamplain.org website once that goes live this spring. I'll put my name and contact information into the chat if anyone has any questions or wants to learn more about this opportunity. And I'll also put in a plug for Lake Champlain Basin Program grant opportunities that would apply to many of the organizations that are on the call today. Those grant opportunities usually open August to October every year. And so if you have any questions and if you're an organization within the Lake Champlain Basin, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have about those as well. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Lauren. Appreciate that. Um, I'm really excited about the Streamwise program and about, um, yeah, getting that off the ground. So thanks. Uh, so next up we have the Nature Conservancy. Do we have somebody from the Nature Conservancy on the call right now? Okay, well, we can come back to them if they come onto the call. Um, and then after them, we have the uh, Vermont Land Trust. Is there um, someone to give an update from Vermont Land Trust on the call today? Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Alaire Diamond from Vermont Land Trust, and I am really excited to be here for this conference. Um, we, in the last couple of years have been really ramping up our riparian work, so both plantings um, and also in-stream restoration um, and looking at those strategic wood addition um, work as well. So we are kind of looking at some different options for trying to deal with the kind of the, the issue with getting material. Um, we're looking more at live stakes and finding places on our conserved lands that our sources of live stakes, figuring out how to store those um, and incorporating that more into our work as well. So I'll be doing um, a little bit of a deeper dive into one of the wood addition stream projects um, tomorrow afternoon with Shane Jacobs from the Nature Conservancy. And um, just always excited to work with all, many of you as partners and to learn what everyone else is up to as well and to keep collaborating. Thanks. Great, thanks so much, Lair. Um, good to see you. So next up, we have uh, Meg Carter with the Northwood Stewardship Center. Hi, um, I'm Meg Carter with the Northwood Stewardship Center. Um, we're a small environmental nonprofit. Um, we focus on environmental conservation and education up in the Northeast Kingdom. Um, we have several different departments, so our Conservation Corps fields youth and professional core crews. Um, our Forestry Department helps people manage their land for um, ecological goals. And um, our Education Department has uh, summer camps and after-school programs. Um, and then there's the Conservation Science Department. And our focus is the implementation of water quality and wildlife habitat improvement projects. Um, but we've also done planning, design, project development, um, and we're also a member of the currently being rolled out Basin Water Quality Council for the Mpumagog Watershed. <clears throat> um, right now we have two conservation science implementation crews 
uh, which are majority grant funded, although we also contract them out for projects that aren't eligible for grant funds. Um, we have the Spring Woods and Waters Crew, uh, which is funded through a Vermont DEC Clean Water Initiative Program grant. It's a blended student, college student pro crew that we're doing in partnership with um, Northern Vermont University. So um, the crew gets paid like employees, but they also get credit um, for some educational opportunities that we're gonna be um, providing to them. They're gonna be doing four weeks of riparian buffer planting uh, starting the last week of April in partnership with the Connecticut River Conservancy. Um, and they're planning on planting about 5,000 trees plus about 1,000 live stakes. Um, and we usually have another woods and waters or watershed crew in the fall and they'll do another uh, three to four weeks of tree planting, usually starting in mid-October. <clears throat> we also this spring have our um, riparian lands crew, which is running, it's already running. They started in March, early March, and they're gonna go until early November. And um, they're gonna be pulling and planting several hundred trees this spring and probably again in the fall on um, uh, for uh, fish and wildlife lands. And that's in partnership with Vermont Fish and Wildlife and funded through a Great Lakes Fisheries Commission um, grant. They're also be doing honeysuckle removal along the Black River and uh, planting silver maples into the bare areas created by the honeysuckle removal. Um, and they'll also be looking for seed for floodplain forest restoration um, our spring species, if you see any, <laughs> let us know with GPS points. Uh, it's red maple, silver maple, eastern cottonwood, big tooth aspen, quaking aspen, black willow, and American elm. And we would love to get some, some GPS points from you if you see any of those, especially females. Um, the, that crew also uh, works on fish and wildlife access areas to do stormwater improvements and um, also to um, put in steps to make them more accessible to people without creating uh, pathways that are gonna erode into surface waters. Um, we are cruise this spring have also been hired by TNC to do some elm pruning at the Lemington uh, Dutch Elm Disease Resistance Experimental Site. So we've got a lot going on. Awesome, that is a lot, Meg. Um, thanks for giving that update. Uh, so next up, we have the Intervale Conservation Nursery, but I'm not sure if anybody from uh, that organization is on the call right now. Do we have anyone from ICN? All right. Um, then after them is the um, Osable River Association, and Carrie Ann, I think you're giving the update. Muted. <laughs> Thanks, Allison. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm Carrie Persian. I work as the Biodiversity Research Manager for the Osable River Association. We're a professionally staffed watershed association on the New York side of Lake Champlain. Uh, the Osable watershed is 512 square miles. I think our, um, our mission is we feel that science um, plus stewardship equals solutions for our community, uh, our wild and human communities. And we work across five broad goals to, to achieve that mission. First, in our Healthy Streams program, we focus on um, the form and function of our rivers and streams and uh, understand that they contribute to the well being of, of the whole system. We've been doing culvert replacements since 2008, and we've created a comprehensive restoration plan for the East Branch of the Osable River. Um, and completed our first project on that plan, a large scale project last, last summer. And the next project is getting off the ground this year uh, with completion next year. We've got a clean water program where we're looking, uh, keeping a close eye on the water quality of our lakes and streams in the watershed. And then I'm in charge of our biodiverse habitats program. I think this program ties most closely to the conference. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, and I focus not only on invasive species management um, and identification, working with landowners and partner organizations, but we focus a lot on our native native plants. And so we've done several biological um, botanical inventories of our near near stream plant communities and uh, used that data to create native seed mixes. And we're hoping to expand that work um, this summer, creating. Uh, native seed mixes for a variety of different near stream uh, and near river habitats. 
our riparian restoration work is big and getting bigger. And so we're looking for several different ways to improve that work. Um, we've done monitoring of our tree growth over the years uh, at several sites. We have several long-term plant monitoring sites. And we try to tie the riparian restoration right into that stream restoration work that we do, um, keeping an eye on the long-term. The rest of our work is, excuse me. <laughs> the rest of our work focuses on engaging our communities and providing public education. Um, with that, I'll, I'll pass it back over to Allison. Thank you. Thanks so much, Carrie. Appreciate the update. It's good to hear from some of our New York partners as well. Um, so next up, we have uh, Jesse Markson with Yellow Bud. Hello, hello. Sorry for the delay. So my name is Jesse Marks and I run Yellow Bud Farm, which is a new nursery entity. We've been propagating for about four years. Uh, four members that run it have all been propagating individually and have kind of a diverse skill set in uh, mechanical backgrounds or ecological backgrounds or, or simply just have a lot of practical knowledge. And uh, some of our core um, value that we see is something that we can provide is uh, really taking a keen look at what we're growing from um, a genetic perspective, really selecting for traits that are ecologically beneficial as well as have um, the potential for uh, high value market products or um, let me give you an example. So I only realized that I was gonna be presenting uh, two days ago, but I'm just gonna show you a little bit about our namesake. So yellow bud uh, is the common name that we're adopting for uh, what's also commonly called butternut hickory or caria cordiformis. Cordiformis just meaning heart-shaped, though the nuts often don't look like this as having that kind of chordate shape. Um, this is a long-lived native timber form tree. And uh, not only is this riparian adapted tree, but it also can be found in high density and upland contexts. Um, this one tree produced, well, was collected about 110 gallons which we also have a, a kind of partner organizations that we started, which we got a USDA specialty crop block grant for to press this oil. So we're actively kind of trying to create the right protocols for propagation of hard to produce trees that have these significant staple dietary offerings um, and also trying to figure out the market so those who are planting them can have a avenue secured avenue of where they can sell these, these products. Um, I mentioned that they're riparian. I guess I can show just one example right by the Connecticut, um, crossing the bridge from, uh, I guess this is Norwich to Hanover, um, but you can see them all over the place. And this is just one example of the hyperdominance. Every single uh, leafless tree in this picture is the yellow bud hickory. Uh, they leaf out late, they flower late. This uh, flowering I'm picture here. I'm sorry. You're From... up next. You have about 30 seconds. <laughs> oh, all righty. Uh, anyway, uh, so this is just one example of the trees that we provide, um, focusing on highly transplantable, hard to produce trees such as yellow bud hickory, um, but not limited to. This is just one example of the many trees that we produce. Anyway, could talk a lot more about that if anyone has questions later. Great, thanks so much, Jesse. Um, really excited about some of the work that Yellow Bud is doing. Um, cool to see those pictures too. Um, so next up we have um, the Mississauga River Basin Association and um, Ellen Fox, I think you're providing that update. Yeah, hi everyone. Sorry, I don't have video or maybe I do on this computer, but I don't know where it is. So I apologize for that. Um, I'll be really brief though. So um, if there's not much disembodied voice action, but 
Uh, MRBA just is, we're really excited about uh, success of our partnerships over this past year. And like all of us, we work in partnership with many of you. Um, in particular, a couple highlights, we were able to do some really large riparian buffer plantings in collaboration with BLT. So BLT gets the easement. We're able to come in and plant lots of trees. Um, one example on the main stem in Lowell was the Randall Farm um, and then the Bro Farm in Troy. Um, both are areas that, um, particularly in Troy, there's extensive flooding um, yearly. So uh, we were really excited about that. Uh, another great planting project that we have coming up um, this year again in, in a similar location is with uh, on land owned by the town of Troy. And so we'll engage a group called Cat Rock Ventures. Um, Cat Rock provides outdoor sort of uh, transformational experiences for young people from the Bronx. Um, around 70 kids or so will come up with that program and they've begun annually to plant um, in areas adjacent to the main stem. So we're really excited to have them again this spring. Um, thinking about being on town land, we've started working with towns, particularly in the headwater towns, the upper Mississippi, working with them to implement uh, river corridor productions uh, at the municipal level. So zoning bylaws and things like that. And those discussions have, uh, created further opportunities. Um, a good example, the village of North Troy has applied for an EPA program to invest in the recreation economy in rural communities and uh, more and more a healthy river and riparian corridor are really key to that effort. Um, the last partnership to highlight, I think for us is the uh, a Sea Grant partnership, the LEAP program. Last summer, we had two student interns working with us throughout July, um, sort of four days a week, half days. And if there are other groups that are interested in this, I encourage you to participate in the program if the opportunity comes up. You know, these kids were great. It's great to have fresh energy and creativity. Um, when we go and visit with landowners at project sites, I think it's really valuable both for the student and for the landowner, like really inspiring to have young people uh, sharing their views and their hopes. Um, it gives more meaning to the work that we do. So um, we're really glad to be here and just gratitude for all the partners that make, you know, meaning for all of our work. So thanks. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ellen. Um, so next up, we have uh, the Vermont Association of Conservation Districts, and I think Merrill is giving the update. Hi, everyone. Um, do, does Friends of the Winooski River have an update, or are they not on currently? Uh, the, they do have an update, but um, we just had to bump them to a little bit later. In the oh, okay. Schedule. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, so things That's okay. moved around just a little bit. Yeah, great. Hello, everyone. Meryl Burconier, uh, conservation planner and technical staff member with Vermont Association of Conservation Districts, or BACD. Um, I see some of my coworkers are on the line, and district staff are also um, here, too. So I'll speak a little bit to both. So BACD is a nonprofit membership association that represents and supports the conservation districts, and we also implement statewide programs. Um, there are 14 natural resource conservation districts or NRCDs across the state of Vermont defined by county or watershed boundaries. In these districts, uh, they work directly with landowners and farmers uh, and communities and partner organizations to conserve and protect uh, Vermont's natural resources. So in, in addition to supporting these districts, BACD also has a robust technical staff like myself and we work alongside federal and state uh, partners who are involved with the Vermont Agriculture Water Quality Partnership. Um, so we work in NRCS staff, uh, with NRCS staff in USDA offices across the state. We help landowners apply to financial assistance programs, and we help provide technical assistance to, to conserve resources and um, improve water quality as well. So. Our most popular program through NRCS or the Farm Bill is the uh, Environmental Quality Incentives Program or EQIP. And just to give you an idea, some 
riparian restoration practices available through EQIP include stream crossings, stream habitat improvement and management, um, such as strategic woody additions, nutrient management planning, tree and shrub establishment, invasive species treatment. Um, so producers or people who are interested in learning more can reach out to NRCS field offices, and I believe we'll have a representative speaking more to that later on in the call. Um, and VSCG tech staff, we also have flexibility to work with other partners like UVM Extension on their nutrient management planning. So that has gone on each year. Uh, we have two drones uh, in, <laughs> in our company and we've been testing them uh, to see how they can assess water quality concerns, how we can use them to design farm projects or verify practice completion. Um, and I encourage you to learn more about VACD and I'm gonna plug in the I guess VACD website, uh, and you can also access our 2021 annual report through here. And there's a great video that uh, Peter Danforth, District Manager of Lamoille County Conservation District, he made kind of showing a day in the life of the conservation district. Um, so through this website, you can connect with your local conservation district and see whatever efforts they're leading in your county or watershed. Um, just to give you an idea of the 2021 numbers, the districts collectively across the state in 2021 collected around 1,400 soil, manure, and water quality samples at farms. They created and updated 86 nutrient management plans. They planted close to 8,000 tree and shrub stems to filter runoff um, and helped install around 700 feet of vegetation on lakeshore lines and 13,000 feet of vegetation on, uh, to protect streams. Uh, they've also designed in 2021 27 storm water projects now ready for implementation and completed one dam removal project at John Johnson's Mill Dam in Bakersfield. Um, so this is just a brief glimpse of conservation district activities. And to wrap up, I'd like to share two announcements from the Franklin County Natural Resource Conservation District. So Katie Donarski uh, just finished up listing a lot of relevant programs for Northwest Vermont regarding riparian restoration. So that's a great cheat sheet and resource to look at um, for people in this area. And then they're also hosting an Earth Day tree planting on April 22nd, and they're looking for volunteers. So if you're interested in volunteering, um, the link will be here for the RSVP. And thanks, everyone. Happy to be here. Great. Thanks, Meryl. It's great to have you here, too. Um, so next we have um, the Vermont DEC Rivers Program, and Todd Menes is going to give the update. Good morning, folks. I'm going to be working on sharing my screen here, and you're going to see my head going all the place because I got a second screen above. Where is that? There it is. And is that on for you, folks? Good. So... Why does the Vermont Rivers Program support removing obsolete dams? When we get the repairing vegetation reestablished after the dam removal, what's good for the fish is good for us and good for our budget. If you're not familiar with the dam task force, it's their logo right here. Come on, here we go. Connolly Pond as an example, I'm gonna start with the end in mind. This is the sustainability diagram. Dam removals hit the sustainability center of the diagram. This is Connolly Pond wetland. The summer after the drawdown is gonna be taken out probably next year, maybe this year. When the flows are carrying sediments into the impoundment, it's also carrying seed stock. And the native seed stock is in a low oxygen environment. It's dormant. You drop the water level down, it pulls oxygen into the sediments. Boom, it explodes. It's like two weeks, it starts to get green. I'm never, I'm always amazed. Now this is Connolly Pond. And again, it's not just fish, but there's also other wildlife. And come on, there we go. Now I apologize. That's the fish seine net. And I apologize for the sexism. I have no idea if it was male or female. 
the muskrat lived the, while we were doing this drawdown, the big fish that were surface feeding, that was the reason for the seine net to keep them in the pond. Um, this is Peggy's pond dam removal, the planting plan afterwards. This is what it looked like the first summer after the drawdown and last summer it was just verdant gorgeous. They're gonna put a outlook here. There'll be a little kiosk with some e ecological and historical information. So this is the Dunkley Pond Dam before removal. The dam histories are really cool. This was built two years after the Vermont became a state by soldiers who served in the Green Mountain Boys with Ethan Allen. And here's what it looks like. This is about three days after anything was planted. There's a different wetland mix here. Upland Cons Vermont Conservation Seedman, there was four different seed mixes. Look at this, got four deer here. That was the dam elevation, it was about 13 and a half feet tall. All of that soft sediment, the deer couldn't get across, they couldn't get up and down, of course, because of the dam, but also the soft sediments. Now they can move. And look at this, 400 pounds of phosphorus removed. It's gonna store future phosphorus from getting into Lake Champlain. A lot of reasons for doing these. This is the pocket park that was at the upstream end. The dam is down below. I recently heard somebody say it takes a village to remove a dam. This is Doug Osborne, the project engineer, Karina Daly, the project manager. And there was a lot of partners involved in this, people that would have a little bit of time in this. And everyone walks away smiling. The neighbors around the pond at first were, no, you're not taking that down. After it, oh, this is great. Boy, I objected, but thanks, this is really great. Everybody walks away smiling. So if you've got a, oh, let me hit the chat here. If you've got a dam near you and wanna contact me, I'm gonna hit chat. There's my contact information. Love to talk to you about dam removals and helping out with the buffer plantings because it's usually the summer afterwards that we put the stock, the plant stock in. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Todd, for sharing that. Um, so before we move on to the next one, I just wanted to say um, we're doing a really great job keeping updates both brief and informative. I really appreciate that from everybody. Um, because of that, we are ahead of schedule. So if there's anybody who would like to give an update but wasn't um, included in the um, schedule of the 20 or so updates, send me a message. And as long as we continue to stay ahead of schedule, I'm, we can probably get you in. So just send me a message in the chat if that's something that you want to do. Um, so next up, we have uh, Ben Gabus, who's going to be giving an update for the CREP program. Ben, are you there? I see that you're there, but I don't hear you. Okay. Um, well, we can we can come back to Ben. So, um, Sean, are you ready to give an update for Friends of the Winooski? Yeah, I can do that. Okay, great. I'm gonna share my screen too here. Oh no. All right, I'm going to talk about um, the Friends of the Winooski's uh, Lawn to Forest Program, which we, which is based on our riparian restoration projects. Um, we've been doing re uh, riparian restoration for quite a while now. So we started in 2006 with our first one with 215 trees. Oops. And um, we've been you know, planting about 3,000 trees you know, on, on average per year since then, um, usually about five to six sites per year. Um, so we, we've been doing a lot of you know, standard repair and restoration. Um, 
thing is that for most of those projects, we have um, uh, you know the usual requirements. The 35 foot minimum buffer width um, has to be about you know a half an acre at least, uh, with a tree density of 300 trees, and it you know of course directly on some on a stream. Um, but more and more, we got contacts from landowners that had a parcel like this. This is on Millbrook in Bolton on Nashville Road. Uh, somebody who's got a fairly small parcel um, and you know a thin riparian buffer, um, but wants to do something more with their land. Wants to do what you know they, they contact us to see if they can plant trees, or what they should you know what for advice about what they should do with their land. Um, and we just didn't have funding for that kind of work. Um, this is a, another site, a mobile home, um, you know, uh, uh, park in Berlin. Again, they have a tributary. This is a, tri a tributary to the Dog River. There's the Dog River on the on the west side there. Um, they wanted to, you know, they they had uh, been devastated by Irene. They had had lots of trees here. Um, they had to just, you know, sort of clear the whole, or, well, I guess the, the previous owner just cleared everything, bulldozed all the trees down. And they were devastated, you know, they were just heartbroken that they had lost all these trees. They wanted to plant something along that, that, that stream. Uh, but again, you know, that was, it was a small planting. We wouldn't have had any kind of money to, to do that. Um, because obviously you can't have, there's some places here that, I mean, it really wouldn't make sense to do a 35 foot buffer. Um, or in this case, uh, we've got a neighborhood uh, where we had done a, we had tried, well, we did do a stormwater project. Um, two areas uh, where the storm drains were emptying, uh, this one here and then down here as well, um, were eroding out. Um, just these, these were big gullies and um, the water just pouring off of this hill, it's clay soils. Um, very high water table, so you know, no, no real capacity for any sort of typical stormwater projects. Um, yet the, you know, the, we had been contacted by a neighbor who wanted to to do something there, and we did do a, a you know, a, a stabilization project on this um, on this gully. Uh, but still, it seemed like there was other thing, you know, more to be done on 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 that. Uh, and you know, it seemed like planting trees was an, a, a particularly good option here because you know lots of lawns, um, very few trees, and um, this water just pouring out of the ground practically. In several cases, there really was water bubbling out of the ground. Um, and so we um, here's an example of of one of the um, you know uh, the, one of the properties uh, or a property that's that's like the ones that were that were in that neighborhood. Lots of lawn sloped, um, leading to either uh, right into a storm drain or, or a, a swale that was carrying storm water. So we um, wrote a grant to get uh, uh, money from uh, uh, Lake Champlain Basin Program to do planting projects on these kinds of properties. And so we piloted this program, we call it Lawns to Forest. Uh, we started in 2020, great, great timing for us. <laughs> um, and um, we've, We've now almost completed it, and you know, once this spring is over, we will have done 16 these of these smaller plantings on four acres. Um, it's based on a restore uh, the riparian restoration model of we do about we do 40 400 uh, stems per acre things. Uh, you know, the goal is to have a naturalized area. We plant with volunteers, and it's free to landowners. We do we we provide the trees and the labor to plant them. We have a similar landowner agreement. Um, but there's, these are all small sites, um, you know, so sometimes only, you know, 20, um, 20 trees or so. Um, this one, this is the hillside that I showed in that picture earlier, the sloped hillside. Uh, we had um, AmeriCorps members out. They, you know, we had a bunch of them that came out to, to plant. And so this one was actually more like um, 50 trees on that, that lawn. Um, and we did have some challenges that uh, homeowners association, there was a homeowners association in this neighborhood and they were not too happy initially to hear about, you know, that, that they had a deed restriction that they felt required lawn, required lawn. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, we've had to sort of deal with some of the things like that. Um, it's the, these, the, the, the time it takes to do these is, is almost as much as a 300 or, you know, um, to, to thousand tree 
riparian restoration site because um, landowners' expectations, they, you know, they care a lot more about what these things look like and what, what species you have. And so it, even you know, a small planting like this one of 50 trees ended up taking a lot of time. And then yeah, the last thing is that um, continued funding. We did not get this program renewed in terms of funding. And so we're, we're trying, but we'd really like to keep this going because it really does have a lot of benefits. I mean, in addition, to the usual riparian restoration um, benefits of you know holding the soil and uh, providing habitat, um, trees and shrubs absorb like you know 30 to 80 percent more than just grass alone. There's been studies that have been done that show that, um, and you know even if once you get a closed canopy, um, the a closed canopy will intercept 30 percent of natural rainfall. So that means that 30 percent never remains the ground. It just hits the, you know hits the leaves and then evaporates back up. So in terms of stormwater mitigation, this is, you know, we, we feel like this is a really um, great idea, especially in, you know, so many places or like that neighborhood I showed where you know, there's clay soils, a high water table, and, you know, usual stormwater mitigation um, practices just aren't, aren't feasible there. Um, but another thing we've really noticed is that, that their landowners are become much more aware of, of the, their impact and they become much more engaged and then their neighbors also become more aware and more engaged. In addition to the volunteers that come out, they, you know, we were able, this is really a great education um, opportunity and they're visible. So they're, you know, often they're not, um, uh, you know, they're, they're in people's neighborhoods. So um, that's all I have. Thanks. Perfect. Thanks you. Thank you so much, Sean. So um, next we have NRCS and Toby Alexander is going to provide an update. Okay. Um, thanks, Allison. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm Toby Alexander. I'm with the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. I'm the state biologist and forester for NRCS. Uh, for folks that aren't familiar with NRCS, we work with private uh, uh, producers, farmers, uh, forest landowners on working lands, provide conservation through a variety of different practices to address environmental problems that we call resource concerns. <clears throat> We recently hired um, a new state conservationist. I don't know if everybody's heard about that. Travis Thomas, and he was the director of the Pacific Islands area based in Hawaii. He started in February and he's, he take, he's taking over for uh, Vicki Drew, who is a longtime state conservationist. And um, so we're, we're excited to have Travis. He's, he's definitely interested in forestry, agroforestry, which a lot of these riparian practices are. And, um, so we're looking forward to, to having him here. So I, I did want to um, share a few a few things. I, I tend to get these questions a, a bit, and I wanted to share um, some information. Are you able to see that, Allison? Not yet. Oh, sorry. About it's that. looking good. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> so, try to get this to maximize. <clears throat> so, uh, one of the one of the big uh, conservation programs that NRCS deals with is the Farm Bill, and, and we have conservation programs within that. Um, hopefully, we hear from Ben Gabus later uh, to talk about the Farm Service Agency uh, Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program because that's tied in very closely with us. We work closely with the conservation. Districts work with the FSA, Vermont Agency Bag, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department. All many of the partners on this call we work very closely with. That's how we get um, a lot of good work done uh, across the state. We have field offices where our field staff, soil conservationists, work um, scattered across the state. Uh, that, that's uh, working with local conservation districts who are in those areas to work with uh, producers and forest landowners. A uh, question I often get is, you know, how many you know, trees or shrubs and that sort of thing are we planting? And um, so I just wanted to highlight a few a few numbers uh, that that we have here. Uh, so in in 2021, through the Environmental Quality Incentive Program or through the Regional uh, Conservation Partnership Program (RCPP), uh, we had about 16 acres of tree and shrub establishment, and that can be a bit flexible. It, it doesn't necessarily have to be tied to um, 
to the riparian areas or wetlands, but it, it sometimes is, oftentimes is. So I just want to highlight that. Also, to kind of give people a sense of how much uh, land is being planted through some of our programs. Uh, 27 acres of riparian forest buffer, 391, that was done um, in 2021 as well through that um, program. Much of that was through our CPP. Uh, one, one challenge that we've had uh, to, uh, to sell the buffers, at least to our, our, to our producers, is that the funding typically was not as high as it can be through the CREP program. <clears throat> so the CREP program, and I'm sure Ben will be talking about this a bit more, uh, it, it not only pays for the, the, the trees uh, with some partnerships as well, um, but it also rents the land and provides an incentive payment to the landowner. Through NRCS, our, our farm bill programs, we typically pay a portion of the cost. Um, and so, you know, typically that's three quarters of the cost roughly that, that we expect it to, to cost the landowner. And uh, in the last few years, we've had a few interesting approaches um, that we've been able to take advantage of. So for um, high priority practices that address water quality impairment or conservation or habitat, um, we've been able to hire offer a higher payment rate for some of these important practices like riparian forest buffer, trenchless habitat, and sulfur structures. Those are just a few of the practices. And the same is true for the first water protection practices that we, we've also established in some target watersheds. Um, you can see those there. Um, again, those are a higher payment rate, and I think that's helped to bump up our numbers a little bit for the riparian forest buffer and, and, and some of these associated practices that are helping water quality. Um, I, I'm just jumping in a little bit here for uh, Jim Eikenbeer, our wetland specialist. Uh, he, he runs with this program, Wetland Reserve Easement Program, for the most part. And they've been getting quite active with establishing uh, trees and shrubs on some of our easements. Uh, these are really large areas associated with some large rivers, such as Otter Creek and others throughout the state. Uh, as part of this, they do wetland restoration. Uh, that includes doing ditch plugs, you know, uh, Reestablishing topography, microtopography out on there, uh, removing berms along the, the stream, reestablishing that that hydrologic regime that's necessary for these wetlands to function, and then establishing or trying to establish uh, trees and shrubs, woody cover out there. And that's been a challenge in a lot of places in the Champlain Valley that are just be a reef canary grass. And so it's it's really great. We're going to hear about uh, various approaches to um, establish trees and shrubs in some of these challenging environments. We're doing a lot more site prep than we used to do, uh, various approaches. So it'll be really great to hear what everybody has to say and what we've learned over the last year, uh, in addition to the years before that. So 2021, uh, Jim said they did about 20 acres and about 4,000 stems. And this year, um, they're looking to have over 100 acres and, and 20,000 plus stems going into the ground there. So that's, that's really great, great work out there. Um, one last thing I just want to mention is that you know a focus of NRCS is 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 not is also a climate change resiliency and of course habitat and you know we can we can kind of check a lot of these boxes with the stream habitat work that we started to adopt from um, um, working with Mont Fish and Wildlife TU and other partners um, we started to implement some strategic wood addition projects in the state. Um, and, uh, you know, you can see in this picture, um, we've got, you know, a lot of, a lot of, uh, detritus leaves, uh, small twigs, et cetera, being captured by these, uh, these wood structures. And it's also narrowing the channel and providing cover and allowing access to the floodplains. All sorts of really important ecological functions are happening through this practice. We're, we're excited about it. Um, and you know, actually, uh, Red Start, uh, Ben was on the call earlier, has really brought a lot of these projects to us, and they're implementing these projects for, for private landowners. And so we've got uh, in 2020, we had about one and a half acres for almost a mile of treatment, and in 2021, we, we bumped that up again and um, got up over 1.3 miles or so. So we're starting to implement this, and we hope to have have more going forward. And um, that's what I have today. Perfect, thank you so much, Toby. Um, so next up we have uh, Will Eldridge for Vermont Fish and Wildlife. Oh, thanks. Um, no, yeah, Toby, that's awesome. 
Um, yeah, uh, so let's see, I just wanted to do a couple things. First, put a plug in for the uh, talk that's coming up next uh, by uh, Pete Emerson, also from the department and Annalise and uh, Fitz Gerhardt. Um, our partners working on that um, rec uh, restoration, the, the, the um, hydro seeding project. Um, but uh, just a bigger issue. Um, so I, I gave a talk recently about, in, in a separate forum about um, tree planting versus natural regeneration. Um, so as you know, we've heard a couple of times today, you know, the challenges with uh, uh, supplying stock for tree plantings and um, the cost of tree planting. And then, you know, Sean kind of pointed out a totally different, Sean White from uh, Friends of the New Ski kind of pointed out a wholly totally different, you know, issue, which is, you know, there's some places where it's gonna be really hard to plant. Um, and so, you know, natural regeneration, um, you know, might be, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a place for natural regeneration possibly in some of these um, sites, uh, you know, looking at, um, you know, maybe a cheaper, easier alternative, something like that. Um, and so I've been, uh, but I also want to point out, I think it really shouldn't be planting versus natural regeneration. Really, I think natural regeneration is the goal of any planting project. Um, just getting trees in the ground is, a, is the first step. But ultimately, what we want to do is have a self-sustaining, resilient, adaptable forested ecosystem. And that requires natural regeneration to achieve that. So what I've been doing um, last year, I started looking at uh, some of our past plantings at, um, on state lands, trying to evaluate natural regeneration. And you know, the reality is it's really hard to achieve natural regeneration on these sites. Um, you know, we've, we've got successful uh, tree survival, but they're, they're what we call lollipops. Um, you know, it's a, it's a tree with, you know, reed canary grass, like a hayfield still underneath it. And that's like up to 20 years after the planting. Um, so, you know, we wouldn't consider those successful in, in terms of the goals that we have, uh, you know, providing either the, you know, first the structure, like the tree, the, the species that are there. Um, it's not successful in terms of the, the functions that it provides. It's not providing habitat. It's not really enhancing water quality. It's not really enhancing uh, flood resiliency. Um, and then in terms of the processes, it's also not successful. So, you know, just getting trees in the ground is a first step, but that's not the last step. You know, ultimately we want, what we want is natural regeneration. Um, but like I said, it, that's actually really hard to achieve. And so, um, you know, we've been doing, looking at ways to um, enhance that. And so the, the talk coming up is gonna talk about one of those strategies um, that we're looking at, but I think there's others out there. And I, I just wanna put a, a plug in for more um, monitoring. I think we need more information on natural regeneration uh, at these, you know, either in associating with tree plantings or, or, or not, you know, but just, you know, what, what are the, what do we do to encourage natural regeneration? Um, and, you know, I guess you know, I just want to start now, but maybe Allison, maybe we can have a topic uh, next year at our meeting about, um, you know, at this meeting, talk, focusing on the natural regeneration and sort of the process, you know, restoring processes um, at these tree plantings and not just the trees themselves, you know, recognizing that there's, that we, natural regeneration needs to be part of, you know, the successful, a successful tree planting. Um, anyway, uh, that's all I've got for now. Thanks. Um, yeah, I can share my uh, uh, contact information in the chat if anybody wants to talk about this. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate that suggestion for um, a topic for next year's meeting or maybe maybe a webinar in between now and then. We don't need to wait until next year to um, talk about that. I think that's a really interesting conversation to have. And it reminded me, uh, I'm now going to just insert a plug here. So today, uh, the Watershed Forestry Partnership released its most recent episode of our podcast, Restoration Roundup. And this episode um, talks about, we interviewed three different landowners in Vermont about why they decided to restore riparian forests on their land, what that experience was like for them. And I thought of this because um, all of them were like, we had massive mortality of the trees the first year and also saw a ton of natural regeneration from the trees that were left or trees that were nearby, just from having sort of like 
remove the grass from that soil, mix up that soil, made it more suitable for trees to seed in the first place. So I think there's a really interesting conversation to be had there. And um, also people should go listen to that podcast on our website. I think it turned out really good. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm learning about podcasting. I think it turned out great. Okay, so the next up we have, um, we have Ben Gabos speaking for CREP. I think we have him now, Ben, do we have you? Uh, can, can you hear me? We can. Okay, I've lost the connection on my computer uh, for some reason. Anyway, I'll just talk. Um, otherwise, I'm going to get kicked till tomorrow. Uh, so, yeah, uh, CREP uh, update real quick. You know, with programs back, it's it's really been back for a couple of years, but we've had so many kinks getting through the process in the farm bill that allowed us to do the program again. That's been like slows molasses. So. Um, we are still slow. It's like a four to six month process, you know, sort of from beginning to end at best to do a, get a project planned um, and to contract. Um, and then, of course, we have to delay, you know, till we can actually do a planting um, since we are pretty much relying on a bare root planting and not natural regen for the most part, although we get that on some projects. We're trying to uh, 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 incentivize that where we can. For sure. Um, anyway, uh, so we're we are working. We basically have. Uh, oh, let me back up. Our marginal pasture rates, which is probably most of the land that we enroll, uh, is you know in permanent pasture or grass and doesn't qualify as a quote cropland rate. The rates for that category have gone up for about ten percent first time in about fifteen years. Um, uh, since I upped them when I started the, this work. Um, and then our cropland in a lot of counties has also gone up uh, quite a bit in some areas. It's the highest it's been, depending on the county and the soil. Um, we had enrolled about uh, 50 acres in 2021 um, and working on those plantings, uh, you know, then and now uh, some were split plantings. Uh, we have 20 so far, you know, in the new year under contract, some being planted some next year. Uh, and then we're working on another, you know, about 150 currently, uh, you know, for the, for the future, you know, we're kind of in some stage with the landowner of planning. Um, and uh, yeah, more all the time. Um, but we're, and, and all those, by the way, are, are all partnered. Again, the, the CREP is a, is a program is a partnership between the Farm Service Agency, uh, which provides all the, the funding to take, you know, agricultural lands out of production uh, for a contract period of 15 years, and the landowner gets an annual rental from Farm Service Agency. Uh, the Farm Service Agency pays the cost share to uh, install the buffers, and if we have additional infrastructure like fencing, if it's a livestock operation, uh, fencing pipeline, water tubs, stream crossings, water development uh, for alternative water. Um, and then uh, the agency of ag uh, provides, you know, upfront incentive payment, a one-time upfront incentive. That's sort of our part, as well as doing pretty much all the planning. And then the Partners Fish and Wildlife Program covers 10% of the cost share that the FSA doesn't cover. Basically, it's a 90% cost share on the part of FSA to install these. So, uh, yeah, I think, uh, and we are also uh, doing a lot of uh, work on re-enrollment projects that are, you know, 15 years old and eligible to re-enroll. There's a couple areas that need a little sprucing up to get the minimum density to re-enroll. Um, then the Partners for Fish and Wildlife is helping, you know, with the cost of doing those plantings and herbicide work to get those up to snuff. And then we, upon re-enrollment, we use FSA money to get them up to the new practice standard, which is more stems than the, when they were originally planned. So uh, yeah, anyway, we're, uh, we're open for business. Um, if you have an agricultural landowner that you think is a good place for a crep buffer and you're doing outreach, you know, let us know. I guess that's it. Great, thank you so much, Ben. Um, so next up, sorry for the confusing messages in the chat, everyone. I didn't see Dave, but he is here. So next up we have um, Dave Wilcox for Vermont Forest Parks and Rec. Hi, everybody. Um, 
so I'm a uh, report on the forest, uh, the watershed forester for the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation. Um, I'm going to report on on my program. Obviously, the Department of Forest and Parks covers all sorts of of uh, topics out there from the forest economy, state parks, state lands management, county foresters, the whole the whole gamut, so to speak. But um, I'm talking about the the the, the forest watershed program, uh, which is primarily AMPs um, and uh, the acceptable management practices uh, that are administered through this program uh, by myself and, and four other AMP foresters are scattered around the districts. Um, and we, we do respond to AMP complaints, uh, provide a lot of technical assistance to, to loggers. That's one of the shifts that we've seen in the last couple of years. We're doing a lot more technical assists um, and and essentially getting to the to the sites before uh, the, the, the trouble happens, so to speak. Um, uh, we also provide training to the LEAP program, logger education to advance professionalism. Um, and a lot of that is geared toward water quality. We've, we've identified stream crossings as the, the biggest source of discharges during logging activities. We have a, a program to uh, get skitter bridges out to folks um, in, in the last, since 2018, we've provided 45 wooden bridges and 10 25 foot steel bridges to, to the logging community and, and foresters are also eligible to receive those bridges. Those were cost shares or um, free bridges uh, in the case of the wooden bridges to, to most of those folks. Um, and we also, uh, the department itself owns five heavy duty truck bridges um, that are steel uh, bridges and we rent those to uh, loggers and foresters, landowners, um, for use on logging operations uh, around the state. Uh, there's a requirement for uh, insurance and a bond, uh, but it's a really inexpensive program for the the landowner or logger. Uh, it's $100 a month, which is dirt cheap for a, a big truck bridge. Um, we have three 25 footers, a 30 footer and a 40 foot bridge. So um, the, the other thing that I, I really wanted to uh, talk about because I have so many folks here um, and I'm gonna share my screen if I um, share screen. Tell let me know when you can see the, the AMP manual. Is that visible? It looks like oh. it's loading. Should be visible okay. in a moment. Yep, there we go. So, so this is the, the the current AMP manual, which hopefully everybody is aware of. Um, it was it was developed in uh, well, the AMPs have been around since eighty seven, but this new manual uh, was revised in in twenty nineteen, and we printed the manual. We've been trying to get it out to folks. We've gone through almost two thousand copies, so. There, somebody has them, um, and the the uh, a couple years ago we started on a process. It's been a while that we've been working on it, but to develop a uh, an AMP app for smartphones. So if I could figure out how to change the this is this is the, the app is almost done. Um, so I wanted to go and show some folks, show you folks the some of the. Uh, capabilities of the of the app and what the purpose um, of the app is. Obviously, the number one purpose is to provide the, the information in the manual um, to users in the field on their phone in an unconnected, you know, you don't need to be connected to, to view any of this stuff um, in the manual. And this is the this is the main uh, screen that gives you all the options of the different parts of the app. The manual, um, it's divided by uh, sections or chapters. And this is obviously the, if you went to the, um, in, in the, the manual for forest buffers and you just scroll down through, um, all the information is there at, at your fingertips. Um, we also have uh, a function in the app where you can locate AMP practices and there's a cost estimator for some of those practices. And, and it will give you um, 
it, it, it's called the cost calculator. It will give you in the once you've gone through all of the different aspects of how many AM water bars, how many bridges, how many culverts, whatever, um, it will give you a cost of applying all those AMPs in the end. Um, it also has uh, a soils function where we didn't create this. We've linked to the UC Davis soil web, but it it it's a seamless transition from the app back and forth between the soils information, um, which is a really great feature to have. Um, and it also has uh, a contact information where you can click on the AMP foresters, or the county foresters, or reporting a spill. Um, and all of, if you're in a connected environment, all of those phone numbers and emails are live. You can just call somebody right there. Um, if you're not connected, you, you get the phone number or the email, but you obviously don't have the ability to to, to call them or email them right then. But um, it has, the tables are, are, are all um, very easy to, to access. Um, you don't have to search through the manual to find the tables. There's a, there's a button um, at the bottom of the screen that brings you right to the tables. Um, and there's a clonometer function that allows you to, uh, I apologize for not having a view of the forest in this uh, screen, but you can, uh, aim the phone just like you would a kilometer, hit hit the screen anywhere, and it will give you all of the table information for that slope, um, whether it's truck road uh, water bars, skid trail water bars, or on the right-hand side at the bottom, um, the forest buffer width, um, all relative to that slope. So um, I, I ran over a little bit, but I wanted to uh, like I said, I had a big group of folks. I wanted to highlight that AMP app. Keep your eyes and ears open. We'll be advertising that, uh, that it's available and doing some training in the near future. So uh, if anybody has any questions on that, feel free to, to contact me. Great, thanks Dave. And um, Dave, it looks like there's a question in the chat for what the link is to get the app. So if you could drop that in there, that would be great. Um, so next up we have Katie Kane for the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Great, thanks Allison. Um, Katie Kane, I'm with the Partners for Fish and Wildlife program with the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, I'm filling in for Chris Smith. He's our state coordinator and he had to jump out to another meeting here. Um, so I'm one of the biologists that works for the program and primarily I focus on riparian habitat restoration. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Partners for Fish and Wildlife program, we are the private lands habitat restoration program for the US Fish and Wildlife Service. So our mission is to work with partners uh, to do habitat restoration on private land. Um, we're not technically a funder, but we can offer financial and technical assistance to project implementation. Um, it's not unheard of for us to have a standalone project that we're just doing ourselves, but by and large, almost everything we do is done with partners, a lot of, a lot of you guys in the room right now. Um, so conservation districts, watershed organizations, and as Ben mentioned, um, we're, a we're a partner on most of the CREP projects that get on the ground. Um, so it's just a snapshot this year, we're working on 25 projects with a whole bunch of different partners um, that total up to be about 185 acres and 37,000 stems that are getting on the ground. Um, so no, no big updates on our end, but um, just we wanted to share a couple of staff updates. Um, right after our last meeting last year, we had um, Dave Rojek join our team as a, um, a year-round biological technician that's helping to support project implementation and a lot of stewardship and maintenance of projects. As we've all been seeing, we've been, you know, finding it's often not enough to just plant trees and walk away. So uh, we're trying to invest some staff time in being able to contribute and come back and do stewardship and maintenance in our projects. Um, and this summer in uh, just over a month or just under a month now, we're going to have two seasonal biotechs joining Dave. So we'll have a crew of three that'll be out working on projects um, to keep them going through the through the summer and the fall. So that's that's it on our end. Perfect, great, thank you so much, Katie. Um, so next up we have Astrid Galvez uh, for Pure Project. Hello everyone, um, thanks for having me. Uh, it's the first time I'm personally attending uh, as I 
recently just joined Perpergeet in the fall. Uh, maybe you've met Paul, Paul Herzstrick, who has been here in this meeting before and has always had good things to say about it. Uh, I'm very excited to meet all of you and get to know more about what is being done in Vermont as well as New York uh, and elsewhere. Uh, so I don't know if any of you are familiar with Perpige or to what extent, but I'll just give a short introduction. So Perpige is a B Corp, is a French B Corp uh, that works with corporate par partners to implement projects in agroforestry, reg ag, as well as tree planting and restoration projects. Uh, we work in over 45 countries and this would be 2022 will be our seventh year working in Vermont with a few partners. Uh, we've uh, planted over 61,000 trees and supported over 100 farmers. Uh, and something that is really impressive about Vermont is the diversity. So we've planted we've supported the planting of approximately 59 different shrub and tree species, which is really impressive for our corporate clients. That seems like very impressive. Of course, that's something that comes with riparian restoration, different from, of course, it, for example, our projects in Ontario, Canada, we plant sometimes only two species because it's more like forest uh, regeneration. Uh, so it yeah, you can plant a couple of species and then you hope that it, other species start to come along. Um, so in terms of updates of our work, uh, we have been affected by COVID. We lost a few clients uh, and funding, which I'm sure maybe some of you can relate. Uh, and that has, hasn't allowed us to fund as many trees as we, as we, as we would hope. But if our predictions are right now, we're overriding this COVID wave, hopefully, and uh, we can get more funding for the following year. So we hope to see our Vermont project definitely grow and support more the restoration of uh, Lake Champlain. Um, in terms of other updates, uh, we recently expanded our communications team. So as such, we've had a more elaborate reporting to our clients. So like I mentioned earlier, Tree diversity is something we, we do focus on because, you know, clients like to hear about uh, different species that they're supporting. And also we focus a lot on grasping the stories from the field. So, so not just the success uh, of all the great things that farmers and organizations like all of you in Vermont are doing, but also challenges that you and farmers might be facing. Uh, which is very important to communicate because it emphasizes, of course, the importance of uh, your and our work, as well as the importance for these clients to fund these type of projects. Uh, you know, working in, in both the Global South and the Global North, we often get, it's, it's sometimes difficult to get support for our Global North projects because they say, well, why should we support, you know, uh, Global North projects when there are other people who who are in more economic need, but we try to emphasize that there is importance in both uh, because there is. Uh, farmers and organizations uh, like all of you face challenges and, and are doing great work. So we really try to emphasize that importance. Um, yeah, and towards next steps, we hope to make our reporting more efficient and monitoring more efficient so that our partners in the field don't have to do as much work so we're trying to see if we can get uh, more, you know, efficient technology so that you can report directly from the field and it, the information comes directly towards us. But right now we're in a very early stage in that aspect, but we hope that can be something that we can implement in the future. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Astrid, and welcome to this group. It's exciting to have you on the call today. Um, so next up, we have uh, Christian Peltier for um, giving the update for Watersheds United Vermont. Awesome. Thanks for having us. My name is Christian Peltier, and I do grant administration for Watersheds United Vermont. And we also have Lynn Mano, our director, on the call. And it's great to see so many familiar faces, but if uh, anyone isn't familiar with Watersheds United Vermont, 
Uh, we're a statewide network of local groups dedicated to the health of their home watersheds. And our mission is to empower community-based watershed groups um, in all parts of the state to protect and restore Vermont's waters. And a huge part of that is tree planting. Um, so today I just want to go over some of the highlights and totals of the numbers of plantings that WUV was able to support in 2021 and then do some uh, updates on what we have planned for 2022 and an overview of the funding options that we have. Um, so one of the big sources of funding that WUV provides for tree plantings is DC's Woody Buffer Block Grant. In 2021, we were able to support 12 sites and uh, which totaled 33 acres. So a little over 11,000 stems we were able to get into the ground with our, our partners. And in 2022, uh, we have 10 sites that we're supporting, um, which is going to be over 16 acres of planting and right around 6,000 stems getting in the ground. So we're really excited for that. And just on a, a high level overview in the last um, three years, we've been able to, we're creeping up on 50 sites supported and over 80 acres, totaling 25,000 stems. So we really just want to thank DEC and thank our planting partners. Um, as we look at the totals from, from all these plants, it's, it's really exciting to see. And so right now we have an active application open if anyone is in need of uh, funding through DEC's Woody Buffer Block Grant Program for a fall 2022 planting. Our applications are open and at the end of this talk, I'll throw the, our website link where you can find our grant guidelines and the application. Um, and we keep it open and rolling. Um, so if anyone has a fall planting that comes up, we're trying to be flexible and uh, allow you to apply when it works for you. So that is live. Um, and then also on our website, uh, WUV has a schedule for all of our grant funding. So you can check out when we'll be, um, when our application for 2023 plantings will go live. Uh, our, our tentative plan for that is to have that open in October and be due in early December of 2022. So you can apply for your spring and fall uh, 2023 plantings then. Um, we have about $200,000 worth of funding to support um, plantings in 2023 and 2024 through the Woody Buffer funding. Um, so we encourage anyone to apply. Um, the grant guidelines are a great place to look to get an overview of this funding. Could work for you. And one other exciting thing I wanted to mention um, with the Woody Buffer funding is now we have enhancement funding that goes along uh, with our, our typical planting funding. So that's going to allow groups to assess any previous sites that they planted with um, Woody Buffer funding. And then it allows for uh, replanting and some maintenance activities at the sites that you planted with this funding. So that's a great option for groups. Um, so we're excited and, and really happy that DC could make that work. Um, it was really great to hear from Astrid and we also support, uh, WUV supports plantings through the Pure Projet funding. Um, and in 2021, we were able to support um, and fund seven sites totaling uh, almost 3000 stems. And for 2022, we have planned another seven sites uh, with a total of 6,000 stems. Um, it's been a great partnership with Pure Projet and um, we're happy that Astrid could give an overview. The, the one thing I wanted to highlight and add is that in 2021, we worked with Pure Projet and, and some of our implementing partners to create a monitoring protocol that's specific to the Pure Projet plantings. But I think this monitoring protocol could be great for other groups if they're interested in adapting a monitoring protocol to use just to assess the uh, their planting. So if anyone is interested in learning more about the monitoring protocol that we have for Pure Projet funding, uh, you can reach out to me and I'm happy to, to share the protocol and, and some of the lessons we learned and, and see if maybe that could work for, for some of your planting. So that's been a great partnership and just want to thank Pure Projet and thank all our implementers um, for doing the great work for those plantings. And the last um, funding source through WUV that I wanted to mention uh, is we have funding uh, around $85,000 through the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Um, and WUV is focusing this uh, funding in 2023 and 2024. But 
um, if anyone is interested in, in learning more about this funding source, you can contact us directly. Um, and for this planting funding, it's the priority is to restore healthy forests and rivers that uh, provide habitat for freshwater mussels and fish, particularly Eastern brook trout. Um, and one other thing to note with this funding is that it has a one-to-one -one match requirement. Um, but luckily we now can pair this funding up uh, with Woody Buff for funds. So that, that'll be an opportunity to provide match for, for this funding. Um, more details are gonna come on the full application process for this, but if you're in need of this funding right away for the 2022 season, uh, you can contact uh, WUV directly and, and we'll, we'll get you set up and see if it could work for your site. So that's a, a quick high level overview of our funding. Um, like I said, I'll put the link to our uh, block grant page in, in the chat and there's a, uh, on that link, there's a bunch of resources that go into the exact requirements for these funding. So that's a great place to start uh, to learn if these could work for you. Um, and then if anyone has any, any questions, feel free to reach out to us at any time. Um, so just wanted to thank everyone. We've had a, a lot of great plantings over the years and we're looking forward to continuing all the great work with our partners. So thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Christian. Um, and I appreciate that update on all the funding opportunities and everything else going on. Um, so next up, we have uh, Mark Labar for Audubon, Vermont. Greetings, all. Thanks uh, for being here. It's great to hear all the news from uh, folks. Um, Mark Labar, Audubon, Vermont. I'm the Conservation Program Manager, and uh, most of you know us uh, for our work with birds and bird habitat. And uh, we continue to do that uh, across Vermont, but recently we've begun looking at, uh, through a new program called Birds and Watersheds, how we connect some of these bird habitat projects to um, the watershed and the riparian areas, which um, often uh, make up uh, the habitat structure that we're working in. Um, we have been, we're kind of new to this, uh, so we've been, uh, working on a couple of sites recently with the Vermont Land Trust. We did some work up what was previously known as Nordic Farms. I forget what the new name is now, uh, doing a planting and habitat restoration or habitat management work up there, removing invasive species and doing plantings on a small drainage down through there. And we're also working with the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department through their habitat stamp program to work on the Lewis Creek Stream Bank Wildlife Management Area experimenting with some different planting options and deer fencing and, and ways to not only uh, enhance the riparian habitat, to, but to make that connectivity to the adjacent upland habitat. Um, we are going to begin shortly um, working with uh, the Vermont, uh, the Connecticut River uh, Conservancy on a new National Fish and Wildlife Foundation grant doing some planning outreach uh, along the Connecticut River. Um, for potential projects in the future. And uh, we've also been really fortunate um, over the past year to have Cassie Wolfanger, who will be presenting later today. Um, she's a Sea Grant Fellow um, that has been working with Audubon Vermont on many of our watershed issues. So um, again, our, our, our goal is that connectivity between watersheds and birds and how we can uh, benefit both uh, with the work that's done out there. That's all for me, Allison. I see that your picture, there you are. All right, great. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, so ne next up we have um, Ron Rhodes for the Connecticut River Conservancy. Thanks, Allison. Um, Connecticut River Conservancy, let's see, since Irene tore through the watershed and end of August 2011. We've planted uh, roughly 70,000 stems in our watershed. That's not all in Vermont, of course. Most of you probably know Fritz Gerhardt, our conservation scientist. He uh, spearheads our uh, tree planting program, certainly in most of Vermont and New Hampshire. Uh, this spring, we've got um, 5,500 stems slated to go on the ground. And then in the fall, we'll be doing another, you know, similar number, five, 5K to 6,000, 6, somewhere in that. Again, that's in all 
all four states. Um, we do that every year, pretty much spring and fall plantings, roughly 10,000 stems a year. All of those stems come from either Intervale Nursery or New England wetland plants in Massachusetts. Um, but that is one of our challenges. You know, the, Allison uh, spoke to it earlier about the availability of native stock and also the size of that stock. Um, we are working with pretty much every partner that has already spoken that's from Vermont, um, whether they're a funder or planting crews from Northwoods and Red Start, et cetera. So we don't do anything by ourselves. Uh, Todd mentioned earlier, it takes a village to remove a dam. Well, it's pretty much the same thing on the tree planting front. <laughs> so we thank you all for your uh, partnerships and your effort. And one other thing uh, on the call with us today is Becky Budd. She's our new restoration projects assistant. Um, we have another NIFWIF grant, not the one Mark just mentioned, but another one to do wood turtle outreach work in Vermont, New Hampshire, and Mass. And we've hired Becky to lead our efforts in that front. And then she'll be um, transitioning to full time and helping us on other stuff also. Thanks, Allison. Perfect. Thank you so much, Ron. Um, so next up, we have uh, Zapata Courage for the DEC Wetlands Program. Hi, folks. Um, thanks, Allison. Um, so I'm not directly related to the rivers, but we know that a lot of wetlands are associated with our rivers and streams. So I wanted to just let you know what the wetland program is doing. Um, we, the wetland program, if you have a wetland um, associated with your river and stream that's part of your restoration uh, project, then the wetland program um, needs to review site plans and approve them. Um, they don't typically need a permit, but they do need to have approval. So this is the wetlands inquiry porthole on the, the wetlands uh, webpage. Um, there's also a few other things going on. Um, we are going to be doing a huge concerted effort to update the Vermont wetland maps. For any of you that have used the VSWI or ANR Atlas wetland mapping knows how inaccurate they really are. Um, so we have been securing funding through EPA uh, to update our mapping. The big push will be this April, which is taking all of the advisory mapping uh, and updating it to become VSWI um, and extending some of the, the mapping where there's contiguity to those mapped polygons. Um, so be seeing, be looking for that. That's going to be highly advertised um, because it's a, a big general uh, determination that's a, a sort of a legal process. But in addition, uh, we'll be doing another mapping in August. The Otter Creek watershed um, has been mapped and that will uh, be added um, to the advisory layer. There'll be um, additional mapping coming this fall. And then we just found out that we got secured funding for the entire Connecticut um, River watershed, which is basically the eastern half of Vermont. Um, and so within the next three to five years, we'll expect um, much better mapping um, on the eastern side of the state as well. Um, we also, um, Let's see, I'm moving it down. We also have a new um, non-reporting general permit, which is related to a lot of the work that you folks are doing on this on the farms um, and also stormwater infrastructure. So if you go on our webpage and go to the permit information, we now have the 9026 general permit. Um, this is to address water quality improvement projects, um, which include projects on farms, um, as well as retrofit for stormwater management. So once again, if there's, if there's wetlands involved, previously it would be a fee-based permit requirement um, to move these projects forward, but in support of the water quality impacts, um, benefiting water quality, uh, we, are, we have a non-reporting general permit, which is a registration, but does not require um, a fee. And then we also 
have a wetlands program YouTube video link um, because we've been really trying to push the education and outreach. And if you go to our link, it will provide you an entire list of all of the training videos um, or information videos that the wetland program has been putting, putting on. Um, and that includes things like culvert replacements. Um, I did a big storm water um, training for the non-reporting general permit. So do get in touch with us um, because we've got a lot of exciting things going on and we often overlap with the work that you're doing from stormwater to culverts to re restoration to dam removals. Um, and lastly, you know, we also have a bioassessment program. And so if you are doing restoration within wetlands, we would love to be able to do pre-restoration um, evaluation or monitoring and then post monitoring in order to capture sort of that success that people are talking about. Um, so thanks for giving me a chance to provide an update and I'm excited to hear all of the great presentations coming up. Awesome. Thank you so much, Zapata. So um, we have three more updates. So next up, um, Holden is going to share some from the Natural Resources Conservation Council. Go ahead, go ahead Holden. Morning, everyone. Uh, Holden Sparacino. Uh, I work very closely with the conservation districts and VACD. You heard an update from Merrill earlier on VACD. Um, so I'm going to keep my update to NRCC's Trees for Streams program specifically. Um, so NRCC works with Vermont's uh, 14 conservation districts across the state, as well as uh, VACD and the uh, conservation dif district plantings are funded through CREP, uh, EQIP, individually funded plantings and our Trees for Streams program. Uh, Trees for Streams is funded by uh, Lake Champlain Basin Program, uh, Vermont DEC, um, Pure Projet and newly NIFWIF as well. Um, we're excited about the NIFWIF planting, or sorry, funding, uh, and we're partnering with WOV on that program. And as Christian mentioned, that program will have a focus on um, Eastern brook trout habitat and aquatic habitat in general across the state. Um, the two things I wanna highlight, so in, in addition to the almost 8,000 uh, trees planted that Merrill mentioned, Trees for Streams uh, implemented around uh, 15 acres um, with the conservation districts across the state on non-agricultural lands. And um, we, we're really excited to see an increased interest from funders and partners on what I would say cumulatively could be called uh, planting enhanced practices. So these include the monitoring and maintenance and other practices that really uh, are aimed at improving the outcomes across a longer span of time past just the planting date. So we're seeing uh, interest from DEC and NIFWIF uh, to support those types of activities, which is really great to see. Um, and, and I should mention Pure Projet has been supporting monitoring and maintenance for quite a few years now. So it's really great to see a lot of partners recognizing uh, the need for the longer term funding uh, to improve outcomes of these plantings. Uh, the other thing to note, conservation districts, like many other groups have mentioned, continue to see uh, difficulty with getting uh, local native tree stock. So happy to you know, think about solutions to that going forward. And a big thanks to all the nurseries across the state that have been supplying uh, local native tree stock for our plantings and other people's plantings. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Holden. So um, next up, our second to last update, we have Kristen Boschnott for the, um, she's gonna talk about the VYCC water quality program. Go ahead, Kristen. Hi, thanks for having me jump in here. Um, so my name is Kristen Boschnott and I am the new water quality projects manager at Vermont Youth Conservation Corps, or VYCC. I wanted to start by sharing that we recently unveiled a new mission statement. And I think it really encapsulates what we do. So take action and build community by working and learning together with the land is what we are all about. Um, and while many of you may be familiar with VYCC um, through seeing one of our trail work crews on one of your favorite hiking trails over the past 25 years, we actually do much more. So we have five project focus areas, which are trails, 
build forestry, farm, and water quality. The water quality program came to be about five years ago. So my role is to match water quality crews with great projects to increase the capacity of many of the partners on this call to do water quality work, while also providing hands-on learning opportunities for youth in paid positions. So our work is all done in partnership with organizations in Vermont, New Hampshire, and New York. Even though Vermont is in our name, we actually do expand a little bit outside of those state boundaries. And we rely on partners to identify projects and complete the design work. So a VYCC crew is ready to plug in as soon as a project is shovel ready. Um, we provide extensive training to our members around safe use of tools, technical skills, as well as leadership and group dynamics so that crews can function efficiently and independently out in the field. This year, our water quality crew is running from June to late October. So we are sort of missing out on the spring tree planting period. But in past years, we have hired crews earlier in the spring, and I'm hoping to do that for 2023 and potentially provide some muscle power for all the great plans that you all have for the spring. But we do lots of other projects in the, uh, the off season, so to speak, uh, for tree planting in the summer, like green stormwater installation, uh, rain gardens and open top culverts. We can also do some rock work doing culvert improvement, um, erosion control on trails, We've done some work doing in-stream process-based restoration and are excited to continue expanding in that area, as well as tree planting and monitoring, and sometimes some mapping and data collection. So there's a wide variety of tasks that water quality crews can plug into. And we achieve all this work by employing a few different types of crews. So we work with local youth crews ages 15 to 17, and typically keep them a little bit closer to our main campus in Richmond. We also hire AmeriCorps service members ages 17 and older, and they oftentimes will receive um, a variety of different projects so that they can sort of experience different uh, fields of work. So they might help with some trails projects and some water quality projects. And we also have pro crews, which are people ages 20 and up with some professional experience looking to build a career and build connections in this field. And so their model is a little bit different um, but whoever uh, or whatever type of project you have, we will do our best to match you with the crew that will have the technical skills and ability to implement it. Um, we do run on a fee-for-service model, so partners are responsible for securing funding to support the crews. Um, so in some ways you can think about us as a contractor, but really the co-benefit of training and inspiring the next generation of conservation stewards and leaders is a big part of what we focus on and what we hope partners find value in. So to wrap up, I am looking to fill three more projects weeks this summer and fall. So if you have a project that needs some additional people power, um, I will put my email in the chat and I would love to talk with you about that. Thanks so much. Awesome, thanks so much, Kristen. Um, so we have our final update uh, and Rainier Lucas is gonna talk about the um, Upper Susquehanna Coalition. Thanks, Allison. Um, happy to be here. Uh, even though we're not regionally connected to, to Vermont, and I'll, I'll share my screen and throw up a, a map here. Um, um, but so, so before, before I started with the Upper Susquehanna Coalition, I actually worked with one of the organizations that's on this call right now, the uh, Missisquoi River Basin Association as an AmeriCorps member. And I just started with the USC back in October. And we are, we are comprised of 22 soil and water conservation districts. Uh, we're the headwaters of the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I found very interesting that everybody seemed to talk about was the stocks and plants and sizes. That's something that we just recently changed. We usually we typically went with bare root stock, but we've been finding better survival and and uh, stuff with containerized like air pruned uh, Anderson band stock. Um, and uh, just really excited to hear everybody that's on this call and what sort of projects that they got going on, their success stories, and uh, if anybody would want to chat about case studies or anything like that, you can feel free to contact me. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Renier. So that is um, all we have for updates for this morning. Thank you, everyone.